That's this equation. In a similar way, he derived equations for every other joint in the model. He then solved all these simultaneous equations to give a value for the weight on each joint as a multiple of t, the weight of an individual beam. Since the architect would know what weight each beam could safely carry, he now knows whether the construction is safe. This was an ingenious piece of applied practical mathematics, combining the mechanics of levers and the algebra of simultaneous equations. In his design for the flat roof of the Sheldonian theater, Christopher Wren was able to call on these principles and adapt them. Wren also had the benefit of being able to use supporting trusses in the attic space. Indeed, the roof support was so strong that for many years this attic was used for storing books from the university press. In celebration of the new philosophy, the ceiling depicts the triumph of the arts and sciences over envy, rapine and brutish scoffing ignorance. The mathematical sciences are represented here. Optic with the telescope, arithmetic, geography and geometry with a pair of compasses. Astronomy. Finally, architecture, seated by a workman holding a plumb line. Towards the end of Cromwell's rule, Christopher Wren and others from the Oxford Philosophical Society were gravitating back towards London to rejoin the group of philosophers meeting at Gresham College. Wren himself was appointed Professor of Astronomy. With the restoration of the monarchy, they could consider forming a society on the lines of Bacon's principles and with the approval of the king. Here is the record of the first meeting of the Royal Society in November 1660. But how did the members promote the new philosophy? Having a formally organized society did bring a number of benefits. Firstly, it acted as a focus for all scientific minds in the country. And here, all those interested in scientific investigations could report their findings and listen to the observations of others. Beginning in 1665, Henry Oldenburg, the secretary of the society, published his monthly philosophical transactions, the oldest scientific journal in the world. And here, for the first time, was a means of mass-producing the results of scientific research. These philosophical transactions could be and were distributed widely throughout Europe and had great influence. Looking at these early issues, you notice a number of differences from a modern scientific journal. The non-mathematical articles were written in a very plain English. Experimental science had not yet developed its mass of jargon and procedures. But it's worth noting that mathematical treatises still tended to be written in Latin, the language of the trained scholar. And there were many articles dealing with unusual phenomena, rare objects, or just hearsay. It was easy, then and now, to ridicule many of these articles. It's only from our 20th century viewpoint that we perceive some articles and observations as of greater consequence than others. To the 17th century experimental philosopher, all facts were of interest. One topic discussed at length over a number of articles concerns the nature and behavior of light. It exemplifies the role of the Royal Society. In the Philosophical Transactions of 1672, there appeared the first correspondence from Isaac Newton about the development of his investigations into light and colour. That article and the ensuing debate in the Philosophical Transactions probably did more to advance scientific knowledge of optics than had anything before. And indeed, this series of experiments, observations and formulation of laws was seen by many as a prime example of Baconian principles at work. And only four years later, the Royal Society was involved in the setting up of 
a most ambitious project in experimental and applied mathematics to date. One whose aim was to solve a long-standing navigational problem and which would lead to a golden age in British astronomical observation. One of the major problems for the 17th century mariner was that of determining the ship's position at sea. Pilot books had been available since the 15th century. But once the navigator was out of sight of land, with no familiar landmarks, what did he do then? A convenient way of defining position had been in use for centuries. Latitude is defined as degrees of arc above or below the equator. Calculation of latitude was fairly simple. The pole star, positioned almost directly over the North Pole, was a reliable indicator. All the navigator had to do was find the angle between it and the horizon. That gave him his latitude. Longitude is defined as degrees east or west of some fixed north-south line, such as the one through London. But in the middle of the 17th century, there was no accurate way to determine longitude. A solution in theory had been foreseen long before. Wherever the seaman is, it's quite easy to determine local noon, which is when the sun is at its highest. If somehow, he were able to know at exactly the same moment the time in London, then he could calculate his longitude. Suppose he calculates his local time to be noon, whilst knowing that in London it's 2 p.m. Since the Earth rotates once in 24 hours, in two hours it will have turned through one twelfth of a rotation, which is 30 degrees. Since his time is ahead of London, he knows he is 30 degrees west of London. But the problem was knowing accurate London time. This could be determined by a number of methods, such as the carrying of an accurate clock or watch on board ship. Clocks, of course, were available in the 17th century, but they were nowhere near sufficiently accurate to make this kind of work possible. In 1675, a Frenchman by the name of Le Sœur Le Saint Pierre approached King Charles II of England with a method by which it was hoped one could find a ship's position at sea by means of the moon. The king, in turn, referred the method to the Royal Society of London, and they brought in the consultation of the visiting Derbyshire astronomer, John Flamsteed. Flamsteed made a full critique of the method and showed, indeed, that it wouldn't work. This, in turn, was to lead to the founding of the Royal Greenwich Observatory. And John Flamsteed was warranted as the first astronomer royal to apply himself with the utmost care and diligence to the rectifying of the tables of the motions of the heavens and the places of the fixed stars in order to find out the so much desired longitude at sea for the perfecting of the art of navigation. And what a formidable task that would be, taking up the whole of Flamsteed's long life and the making of countless thousands of astronomical observations and many, many painstaking mathematical calculations. But before Flamsteed could do any kind of map, it was necessary for him to have a zero point of reference. This was to lead to the establishment of the Greenwich Meridian, the line that separated east from west mathematically, and from 1884 by special convention came to be agreed as the prime meridian of the world and the zero on all of our maps. This is the octagon room at the old Royal Greenwich Observatory, designed by Christopher Wren in 1675 and the nerve center of the Greenwich Observatory for the 40 odd years that Flamsteed was Astronomer Royal. When he first came here, Flamsteed had a rather motley collection of instruments. Some of these indeed were his own pieces, which he brought down from Derby. Others were loaned to him by various friends and fellows of the Royal Society. In this way, Flamsteed was able to chart the positions of the fixed stars and observe the moon's path across them. But the thing that was now required to complete the longitude problem was to predict the future positions of the moon. In fact, tables of future movements of the moon would not become available until almost a century after the project began. 
and the production of these would depend on work carried out by Isaac Newton. It was in this manuscript that Newton provided his remarkable theoretical description of the motion of planets. Newton published this work in 1687, dedicating it in the opening pages to the Royal Society. Here was a mathematical system which unified the whole universe. Using some basic laws of motion and the concept of a gravitational force, Newton had accounted for motion both on Earth and in the heavens. In all this, the new science had played its part. The new spirit of inquiry urged by Sir Francis Bacon, nurtured by the Gresham and Wadham groups, and promoted institutionally by the Royal Society. The early years of the Royal Society had coincided, not by accident, with a blossoming of British mathematical creativity. And shortly, Britain's greatest mathematician would preside over Britain's premier scientific society. Newton's presidency enabled the Royal Society to consolidate its position. It also established his perception of the mathematical principles underlying the universe as the dominant conception in the succeeding centuries. <laughs>